Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this uh, very first 2022 webinar organized by the SGAC Cybersecurity and Space Project Group. I am your host today and moderator. My name is Andrea Capurso and I am a researcher in international space law at Lewis University in Rome, Italy. Now, before I hand over the mic virtually to our distinguished speakers, let me spend a few words on our organi organization, the SGAC, which made this webinar possible. Now, for those of you who don't know, the SGAC is the Space Generation Advisory Council, a global non-governmental nonprofit organization for space enthusiasts under the age of 35 whose goal is to promote, represent, and connect the future, gen the future generation of space experts with today's experts of the field. Our members come from uh, different backgrounds, from law, like myself, but also from uh, economy, uh, engineering, architecture, and so on. And we are divided in different project groups. And if you, if you would like to know more about our project group, you can go to our website, at spacegeneration.org slash projects slash space dash cybersecurity. And you will find all the information to get connected with us in space and cybersecurity project group. With all that said, uh, we can get today's event started. Uh, I have to remind you that the uh, event is being recorded and will be shared on YouTube and other platforms afterwards. Now we have two highly qualified speakers, I have to say today, who will share their knowledge with us. And I am delighted that they accepted our invitation. The first speaker uh, is uh, one of the most brilliant international lawyer who specialized in space law and cybersecurity. Her name is Dimitra Stefudi. She is a uh, PhD researcher at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, uh, when she has focused her study on the legal and policy aspects of space big data. But she is also so many more things. She is a published author in international journals, a lecturer at the advanced LLM in air and space law at Leiden University. She is adjunct faculty and governing member of the International Space University, the ISU. She is also uh, part of the International Institute of Space Law and of the European Center of Space Law. So many things, so really we are lucky to have you here. Dimitra, welcome to our webinar. Thank you very much for the introduction and perhaps the most important, I'm an SJC member and member of this project group. Also, also, exactly. <laughs> Good thing you Thank highlighted you so also that. Um, the second guest today is the very talented Mr. Alexandros Zakaris. Alexandros currently holds a position as an officer in network and information security at ENISA, the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity. Uh, where he's dealing with the design and technical implementation of cybersecurity exercises, cyber era, so-called. Uh, prior to that, Alexandro also works, worked as a deputy cybersecurity manager for the European Union Agency for Global Navigation Satellite System, the so-called GSA, and now better known as USPA in Prague, uh, Czech Republic. He was dealing there with risk and uh, vulnerability management of the Galileo infrastructure. But throughout his career, he has been dealing with so many phases of cybersecurity. And I will try to mention most of them. His expertise includes uh, cyber attack analysis, penetration testing, corporate financing, uh, malware analysis, incident handling, incident response, computer security, and data hiding. He has also participated, for those of you who are expert of the field, in, on DEF CON 22, 2022, sorry, uh, presenting exploitation methods on POS systems inside airports. So Alex, really, thank you so much for finding the time for joining us here today. 
Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, actually, it's a very nice, um, uh, let's say, community. I would uh, like to be involved more in the future, I guess, if I have the opportunity to share my knowledge on topics uh, as this one. And uh, I can't wait to start this presentation. Fantastic. And we will not be there to wait to invite you for another event. But without further ado, I am delighted to pass the floor to Mr. Alexandros Zacharias for his presentation on the on today's topic, cybersecurity and space data. So Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. We see it perfectly, go ahead. Okay, 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 good. So thanks again. My name is Alexander Zaharis. Uh, I'm uh, working for, uh, currently working for ENISA, the cybersecurity agent for cybersecurity in, uh, in the EU. Uh, in the past, I have worked for GSA, um, the Galileo uh, GNSS uh, program, and uh, specifically Galileo, dealing with cybersecurity. Um, and, um, the presentation that I will give today will focus on the European view of things. Um, it's a short presentation, so we cannot, of course, include all that is happening in the landscape of uh, cybersecurity and satellites currently. There are a lot to process, but uh, in this short presentation, I will try to deal only with um, a specific focus on the EU territory, the projects uh, that uh, the EU is running, and uh, of course, the cybersecurity element and how we try to deal with cybersecurity around satellites and data. Um, so let's start with the basics. I would like to go through a few, in my opinion, important milestones um, that uh, throughout the EU cybersecurity strategy strategy uh, mean a lot uh, for specialists like us uh, and uh, especially cybersecurity. Uh, there are either directives or strategies uh, and uh, things that have already happened and things that we are waiting to happen. And I will uh, just uh, show and explain three of them that I feel that, that are important for the rest of the presentation. The one is the space strategy for Europe that uh, was compiled in 2016 and published in 2016. Uh, where the Commission sets the first steps and the first, uh, let's say, um, the ground rules uh, on cybersecurity. It, it mentions cybersecurity specifically and uh, it um, creates, let's say, a precedence on raising awareness and uh, cybersecurity and the risks, the emerging risks, and identifies the space infrastructure as a critical infrastructure that needs attention. This is a, a first but important document that we see um, mentioning the European space infrastructure. And then of course, um, what comes next is uh, the resilience of critical entities uh, directive of 2022, where it specifically states that uh, operators of ground-based infrastructure owned, managed and operated by the member states or by private parties uh, that support space-based services, um, are covered under it. And uh, I will come to the third and uh, important milestone, which is the NIS directive number two, second NIS directive, which is going to be published uh, this year, probably by summer, in which we already know and foresee that uh, the space uh, segment and the space um, area will be probably one of the areas covered. And um, for which uh, we would li like to build uh, security and cybersecurity services and robustness in EU. Now, of course, there are many other uh, activities uh, on the cybersecurity space, irrelevant of, uh, irrelevant of space, uh, like the Cybersecurity Act uh, and other recommendations and uh, directives that are already in place and which are the structure and the foundation of cybersecurity in the EU and uh, for which also ENISA and under which also ENISA is operating, uh, but also other member states and the EU bodies. Uh, so, of course, these are all important because they give us the foundation in order to be able to do our work and to be able also to propose rules and methodologies and uh, um, create a background where, uh, of course, under which uh, private entities or public entities can work 
and work in safety and security and create, of course, services that are secure for our end clients, which are, of course, the EU citizens. Now, uh, for those who don't know or who know uh, the EU space program, uh, there is an overview of it, that uh, there are different services that are running. I'm just giving you an overview in order to set a scope on what we are going to protect and why we're doing this presentation on cybersecurity. But in order to do so, we first have to understand a little bit what is the scope uh, on the EU space. And there are many different programs that are running. You can see a few like the Copernicus, the Galileo, EGNOS, the SSA, and Gov.com. I have been, I have personal experience with Galileo and EGNOS. Uh, but uh, the rest of the projects are equally important. And you can understand that, give, that they provide different, a great variety of services uh, to the end users, um, being companies, uh, the public or private sector, or even uh, the normal average user or citizen. Um, and on the other hand, we have uh, a set of, uh, okay, we, we saw the services, but what are our tools, the tool set that we need to use in order to be able to provide security, to secure this infrastructure, to secure uh, this information that, uh, you know, runs under all these uh, products. So we have uh, a number of ISOs uh, that are relevant and are applicable, and we use them uh, in our daily practices. Uh, actually, also, ENISA has published lately a, a big uh, uh, survey and a big uh, report compiling uh, all the relevant uh, uh, methodologies and standards, uh, cybersecurity standards, and um, even uh, compiled them in a sense that uh, you can see where there can be interoperability, interoperability between sectors. So lessons learned from different sectors, more mature sectors, can apply in a sector that is less mature, for example. So there is a lot of work happening on the methodologies and standards, which is just a tool set uh, that we use daily in order to apply security in uh, different sectors, one being space. And of course, then another key and important element that you need to understand in order also to, to go through this presentation is the fact that whatever applies in uh, any project, in any normal project uh, related to, to cybersecurity applies also to space. So the CIA principle, principle as it's called, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability uh, has a perfect application. And uh, I will show you some examples of attacks later that actually affect one or more of these principles. Um, for those that are not aware of what confidentiality, integrity, and availability are, uh, confidentiality is making assets accessible only to those that are authorized to use them. Integrity and authenticity is safeguarding the accuracy. And uh, of course, uh, whatever is exchanged between two entities is complete. And uh, uh, we guarantee that nothing is tampered in the way, in the middle. And of course, we have availability and no repudiation, meaning that we ensure that the service that is running is running for uh, according to its purpose and ac according to what we have set as a standard. And uh, the users of the service have access to it without disruption. Now. Uh, up to here, we only see a little bit of the building blocks uh, that we as professionals in cybersecurity use, but uh, let's see a little bit about the threat landscape. And specifically, the threat landscape re related to the space segment. So uh, space is a very particular, uh, let's say, uh, type uh, of, uh, of work that, re rely, uh, that needs uh, also uh, because, because of, of its uh, nature, uh, requires specific skills in order to be able to protect. Um, not everyone has access to space technology and, uh, of course, equipment because of uh, how expensive they are, of how rare they are, of how uh, limited uh, it is to find uh, information about uh, the custom customization and the methodologies used in order to, to develop such technology. Which means that also the attackers, the threat actors, uh, have to be equally skilled uh, and equally knowledgeable. And to acquire this knowledge, usually um, they are not the average hacker. Meaning that, uh, of course, there are cases where we have the average hacker trying to attack some part of the space uh, infrastructure or ground infrastructure. But uh, in most cases, we are talking about adversaries that uh, have uh, the money and the knowledge in order to. Uh, be able to exploit vulnerabilities or create vulnerabilities and threats, uh, which are custom made to the specific architecture that uh, is designed and is targeted. 
What I'm trying to say here is that uh, we have as adversaries here not the average hacker that tries to steal your credit card, but uh, a, a bit of more advanced uh, types of uh, entities or people. Um, and uh, going through a little bit of uh, cyber attacks and um, specific cyber attacks for satellites, uh, of course, you will see that the most uh, common ones are the ones that are like, for example, signal, signal jamming or monitoring uh, or spoofing or denial of service, uh, which uh, usually what, uh, they, what the impact is that they try to block uh, whatever signal is being sent or received by a transponder uh, related to a satellite. Uh, of course, these attacks might be easy to, to execute, easier than other attacks, because they do not require a great knowledge of the technology used. They are just agnostic in some cases even, and even the tools are not expensive to buy. You can even buy them from eBay in some cases, but they can achieve their purpose, which is spoofing or jamming or blocking signals. Of course, the impact, it can be not to take control of the satellite, but of course, to jam the device that receives control the satellite to jam a satellite or to take down a satellite or after its orbit of course requires a totally different technology uh, of a different magnitude of uh, power and of course this is not something that uh, anyone can buy or use and uh, of course exploit but you can jump definitely the signal that is received to the end user and uh, this has been done and uh, you can uh, see a lot of uh, attacks uh, also lately but uh, also in the past, uh, I give you an example of uh, attacks that have happened against uh, the maritime industry, uh, where, um, of course, uh, ships uh, rely a lot on the signal coming from the satellites in order to geolocate themselves and uh, draft their routes. And um, there are two types of attacks that are very common. Uh, in this sense, they are jamming and spoofing. Jamming means that uh, suddenly the ship loses, con uh, loses the um, signal, so it cannot know exactly where it is located, it loses track of itself. While spoofing is, you get a signal, but the signal is faulty and uh, you believe that other vessels, for example, are closer to you when they are not, or that you are uh, also on a different location from the one that you are. Uh, of course, both of these are dangerous. And uh, I mean, if you get this type of attack uh, while navigating in very dangerous waters, of course, there can be an accident. Or if you are, an example, approaching a port where it's very difficult to maneuver and accuracy matters. And now, of course, there are other types of attacks and cyber attacks can even happen uh, in space infrastructure, meaning that uh, you can have direct attacks uh, of equipment that are in orbit. And um, this, of course, is not that common, but technology exists. Uh, if you Google search or look in Wikipedia for the killer satellites, you will find actually satellites that are, de that are designed to destroy enemy, other, other enemy satellites uh, or other space assets. Of course, you will ask what why is this relevant to cyber attacks um, and uh, you know a, an old teacher of mine told me once that if i drive a bus and crash on the data center of a company is it a cyber attack or is it not and the truth is that it is because you will lose access to all your information and of course you will be offline so at the end of the day it doesn't matter how the attack happened it's a kinetic attack at the end of the day or a hybrid attack as it's called uh, lately, but uh, the impact is cyber. And at the end of the day, you have to be prepared also for this type of attacks, even if the mitigation is not cyber. And uh, of course, the most interesting of all and the most, let's say, technical and the most um, uh, also tricky in order to execute, uh, but with, uh, let's say, more interesting impact is um, attacks against the software that is used in any element of uh, a, a space infrastructure. And uh, when I talk about any element, I talk about uh, starting from the user element to the ground element to the space element. It doesn't matter. Software is everywhere in all elements. Uh, so you could have backdoors. Uh, you, can, you can have unencrypted data flying around. You can have insecure protocols used or software bugs uh, but exist because a developer, of course, uh, did the mistake. And you have human error and you have supply chain attacks. All of them are different types of attacks, but they uh, can all occur. And uh, of course, the impact uh, can be varying. It can be from uh, a simple denial of service, so you cannot use something, uh, service, uh, but it can be even more dangerous, meaning that you can have people uh, or entities intercepting the information that is being exchanged between satellites uh, or the different infrastructure elements. 
and you can even have uh, maybe a time bomb, time bomb into, into your system that can be triggered at any time the adversary wants in order to stop you from using the infrastructure when you mostly need it. For example, in terms uh, when, when there is a, some type of crisis and you really rely on satellite communications, then it's when uh, the time bomb or the attack is triggered and you lose, of course, uh, this communication element. Um, particularly, supply chain attacks are very popular lately, so we'll stay a little bit uh, on this specific type of attack because also it's uh, the most technical and most interesting in terms of uh, cybersecurity, both uh, in order to execute the attack but also to mitigate the attack. So the supply chain attack is a cyber attack that targets the less secure elements of the supply chain. It means that uh, in the big, very big supply chain of uh, satellite programs, there can be a weak link. And if an attacker can find this weak link and exploit it, he can introduce a problem, a vulnerability to the system that he can later, of course, use in order to exploit and, of course, take down the system itself. And as uh, someone correctly said, uh, you can see here uh, this quote, uh, it doesn't matter if it's one satellite or 1,000 satellites that you are operating. If you have this type of attack, you can uh, you have the ability to take them all out at once. Uh, this is, I mean, this is very powerful. You have to understand that uh, when you do this type of attack, you introduce the problem from the very beginning of the design of an architecture. The problem stays there for an amount of time. And when you really need to trigger the problem in order to take down the system, of course, you have the ability to do so. This is the most, let's say, advanced, but uh, yet, I believe, catastrophic uh, in many terms. Um, now, let's go a little bit back and uh, talk a little uh, about space data. Uh, in order to understand where space data exists and what types of data exist, we have to go back to the actual uh, services that are provided. Uh, and um, again, I'm focusing only on the EU. And uh, you can see here that you have, for example, over 2 billion Galileo enabled devices already. And you have uh, a number of companies that are using Copernicus data. And you have, of course, uh, accuracy because of Galileo and of Egnos. And, uh, and you have Copernicus uh, that uh, uses 16 terabyte of data daily. And um, of course, you have all these different types of applications on agriculture, or natural disasters, on smart cities, on renewable energies, on health, where, for example, in health, you have uh, the ability to forecast air quality. Uh, and you have all these different sensors that uh, collect data and share data and uh, manipulate data daily. So you can understand that the types of data and uh, the quality of data and the, uh, the size of the data exchanged throughout a uh, satellite infrastructure can be huge, can be really huge, and uh, it can vary. So you can have uh, geolocation data, you can have imagery data, you can have operational data, navigation data, sensor data, user data, or authentication data. Different types of data which are used for different purposes. Some are used for the end user, some are used for the service itself, some are used to maintain the infrastructure and uh, manage the infrastructure. But all, at the end of the day, all, all of them need to be protected uh, with different layers of protection, depending on, uh, of course, uh, the usability and the need for this data to exist. Uh, and of course, the impact of losing this data can be different, uh, depending on uh, you know, the different use of them. Um, so I will now go to... I will go a little bit more specific on realistic attacks, on space data attacks, focusing on data only. And um, I will uh, give some examples also of unique challenges uh, on protecting the data themselves. So um, what is mostly challenging for uh, the space element and data is that uh, the fact that you always have earthbound entry points, meaning you have devices that are connected to the real internet. The problem starts from there because you give a bigger, of course, uh, um, you give a, a, a bigger space for them to attack, uh, you give them more opportunities to attack, uh, and of course, they can attack from anywhere since devices are connected to the internet. So uh, another problem is that you have a weak 
long range telemetry uh, between ground stations. And the uplink and downlinks are often transmitted through open telecom network security protocols. Uh, one important thing here, and from my previous experience, uh, the protocols used and the technology used in space, you have to understand that all these elements that are flying around us uh, were not designed to be security robust because 10 years ago, when these devices were launched into space or 15 years ago, cybersecurity was not a thing. It was a thing, but it was not such a thing as it is today. Still, you have these devices which were not security aware flying around. Uh, and now we are trying uh, to protect them with the means that we have available, given that they are flying around and we cannot take them down, patch them, and then send them back up. Of course, whatever is designed and sent and uh, is uh, created from now on and for the last uh, years, of course, it has a focus around cybersecurity, and cybersecurity is a very important element in all levels of design and implementation. But you have to understand that part of the segment which is flying or is out there it was not built. Uh, with security in mind. And this includes also the protocols that are used for exchange of telemetry and information in some cases. So saying this, uh, of course, we have also a growing threat of uh, IoT devices which are using satellite, more and more satellite communications. I can give you an example also of drones that are using satellite communications. And the more IoT devices you have out there using this, uh, the more abuse can happen. Since IoT devices are uh, notoriously known for not being very secure uh, and uh, can be easily hacked, especially some of them that are dumb, dummy. Um, now, satellite ground stations are also vulnerable, and uh, of course, signals can be interrupted. And uh, this has been proven through realistic attacks. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that everything is uh, vulnerable, I'm just saying that uh, these are different uh, weak links in the whole chain of cybersecurity. And uh, some are, uh, let's say, legacy problems, and some are problems that we are facing because of new technologies that are emerging and are connecting more and more. And um, I will give you now two infrastructures, two actually architectures. Uh, the one is a, a typical generic architecture of, uh, of the GNSS, of a geolocation um, satellite, um, including the user segment, control segment, and space segment. And here you can see a little bit of how the information flows. Uh, why I'm, I'm giving you this slide is because I want you to understand that data can exist uh, in all the elements that you see here, to the mobile phone, to the plane, or to the base stations, uh, or to the satellites themselves. Uh, but the flow is important because, as you see in this architecture, for example, if I hack the mobile phone of the user, it doesn't mean that I will be able to go back and hack the satellite. Um, of course, if I manage to hack a base station or if I manage to hack one of the ground control stations, this means that uh, I can do some nasty things, uh, of course, to the satellites themselves. Um, this doesn't mean that the data exists only or the important data exists only on the ground or control segments or in the space segment. Of course, there are satellite data that are reaching the devices of the end user. And of course, there are information there that are useful to steal and to exploit, of course. Now, this is a, a second example of an architecture. This architecture is of, a, of an internet, uh, a satellite internet provider. And here it's more interesting because you can see the bidirectional, uh, let's say, uh, flow of information. And here you have, of course, a user that is using his PC, his laptop or his mobile phone, and he's, he's connected through a router to a satellite modem, which of course receives information from a satellite. And of course, sends back his information through the satellite to the rest of the internet. So uh, you can understand here that uh, there, is, um, there are a few points where uh, the data of the user can travel through. And uh, here you can see an example of uh, my personal data or my data or whatever I'm using this internet connection for, fly through the whole, uh, let's say, infrastructure in order to reach the internet, meaning that the data, my data are also everywhere, uh, including all the rest of the data that we talked about, like, for example, the control data for the satellite to fly properly and all the other data that are you know, flying in different directions. Not all the data, of course, reach uh, to the end user. Now, uh, Going back a little bit, uh, I don't know how much time do I have. 
Oh, you can still go ahead, Alex. Uh, take your time. Okay. Okay, so uh, I would like to focus a little bit on this specific uh, architecture because I would like to, to tell you that uh, attacks are easy to happen in this specific architecture because the whole thing is connected to the internet. Okay, why in this case, it's not the case. Okay, so of course, you can have cyber attacks in both architectures, this is clear. But here, things are a little bit easier since there are exposed interfaces, of course, to the internet. This means that anyone around the world with the right knowledge and technology can somehow pass his information through this whole infrastructure. Now, if the information as passing through this infrastructure can create a problem or not, this is a different story. Okay. Now, for the mitigations, uh, I know that it's uh, very tricky to explain uh, the mit mitigation mechanism of, of such a complex architecture as a satellite architect architecture. There are so many different elements that need to be protected. Uh, it took me almost maybe six to eight months to learn the architecture, I mean, to understand a little bit the architecture of Galileo, six to eight months. And I was doing this for my job, so I cannot explain to you how to start protecting this type of architecture in 10 minutes. But uh, I can tell you that uh, on, a, on an EU level and from an EU perspective, what is important is to create a certification framework. And this is uh, what ENISA is part of and will play a big role in the future. And uh, we, we believe that this is very important. For the satellite technology, we believe that uh, a proper set of uh, a proper certification set should be created with a focus on uh, satellite communications and satellite products. And uh, this should include the specific, uh, um, specific elements that, uh, and uh, methodologies uh, that need to be identified in order to protect this very unique type of technology and infrastructure. And uh, we are on it. It's not something that is ready now, but this is what we are going to work on in the future. Of course, it doesn't mean that there are not uh, any methodologies or requirements that are in place. As I showed you in the beginning, there are many different methodologies, many different um, uh, frameworks, cybersecurity frameworks that are in place and implemented uh, in order to protect this type of infrastructure. But uh, going specific, uh, some key elements that I believe that need to be taken into consideration and be implemented more and more, and we will see them implemented more and more, given that we have limitations, uh, is data encryption and data encryption uh, throughout the whole, uh, let's say, life cycle of the information and data itself. So both in transit and in storage, improvement of existing communication protocols for space data. So mandatory encryption should be enforced and uh, this communication pro protocol should be renewed slowly and are being renewed slowly. Um, of course, my personal favorite is uh, doing trainings and uh, cyber training ranges exist and have been established in the European Space Security and Education Center. So let's use them. And um, uh, training, uh, trainings and exercises are a very powerful tool when you want to simulate cyber attacks and uh, find solutions uh, in order to mitigate different types of problems uh, based on a scenario. And um, these last two bullets are what I'm specialized in and uh, that I hope in the future ENISA will be involved in big large scale cyber exercises which will involve the space uh, entities of EU. Um, as an epilogue, I will just leave you with uh, one quote, which I believe it's very correct, is the fact that cybersecurity community and the space community, community need to collaborate and get prepared to defend all space assets against the growing sophisticated cyber attacks that we are seeing more and more. Have some resources in the presentation, which I believe will be shared with you. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your presentation. It was a really, really interesting, very insightful uh, presentation. And I'm sure that many of our listeners at home have questions and considerations they'd like to share with you. And I do for sure. But I will ask them to wait for a second and keep them there waiting because I want to give the floor right away to our next speaker to build upon this fantastic technical background and give us a bit of insights on the legal perspectives of cybersecurity and space data. So Dimitra 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just a casual check to see whether you can see my screen properly. Perfect. Yes. Absolutely. Um, many thanks to Alexandros for introducing the topic of cybersecurity very nicely and presenting also some current um, initiatives to protect space data systems, uh, as well as describing perhaps how space is becoming a more prominent field in the discussion about cybersecurity. In the next minutes, I will take you through something that is perhaps a bit drier because obviously it's low, but focuses more on what regulations say about cybersecurity, particularly with regard to space systems and space data systems. Um, the main question being what the law, uh, what can the law do to protect the systems and whether this law is enough um, given the current challenges. And let me begin by saying that those issues that emerge recently into the discussion and by recently, I mean, perhaps two, three years, one of which is cybersecurity, were not very um, visible or very well received earlier than that. So uh, five, six years ago, if you would speak about cybersecurity in space, it may have not been received very well by um, a conference audience. And I'm saying that from personal experience. However, things are changing very much and space is becoming bigger. Cybersecurity is becoming bigger. Our reliance on those systems is becoming bigger. So obviously those issues are um, raising more awareness around uh, both communities. Um, what I would uh, like to speak about is of course, what some of the most uh, relevant regulations are saying and how we describe cybersecurity in a legal framework, which may divert from the technical framework that has been described, uh, but it's useful to see what the law specifically describes. Um, what are some challenges afterwards in the application of those laws? Are they enough to secure and provide sufficient security perhaps for space data systems? And if they're not, what could we do? To begin with, the regulation of cybersecurity is a bit fragmented. There is no international framework, so we do not have one organization or one set of standards. And as far as space regulation is concerned, this comes into contrast with uh, the established international space law framework. For those of you who are not familiar, space activities are regulated by international treaties that were adopted by a UN committee uh, specialized on the peaceful uses of outer space. So when it comes to space activities outside the field of cybersecurity, we do see an international framework. We do see general principles that help us regulate activities further on regional or national level. This does not happen as such with cybersecurity, perhaps does not happen yet, but this is the situation right now. When we're talking about regulations on cybersecurity, we usually refer to national laws in different countries around the world and to some regional laws, particularly within the EU. Um, because those are different regulations, of course, eventually they're not uniform. And when we do not have uniformity in a very um, fast paced field as is cybersecurity, but also, of course, the space sector, we may face some challenges down the road. Um, and speaking about lack of uniformity and some lack of baseline, if you wish, there are no borders in cyberspace or in space. Um, this leaves us, as far as the regulation is concerned, with a question as to where did something happen? When we have a specific incident before we qualified as perhaps a crime or a legal issue or something of concern, we usually are able to say that this has happened, for example, in the Netherlands. So we do go and see which law is applicable there, perhaps Dutch law or European law. When it comes to cyber activities and to space activities where we have ground stations in areas around the world, multinational companies, satellites in outer space that is in itself an area outside the sovereignty of any state, we cannot very easily point the figure to one law and say, because this has happened there, we are able to identify which regulation will be applicable. So I'm painting here a picture that is a bit uh, challenging when it comes to regulating cybersecurity and space activities. But if we look a bit into the actual laws, uh, we do receive some clarity. 
I have gathered uh, excerpts from um, perhaps the most relevant laws in this regard, uh, the EU Network and Information Systems Directive, the US uh, Framework on Cybersecurity and the Chinese Framework on Cybersecurity, also because these regions or these countries are very prominent uh, space players as well. So whatever regulations they may have on cybersecurity may also influence the discussion on space and cybersecurity. I realized that I have included a weird uh, format in the slides where each point appears, so bear with me on that. As far as the EU NIST directive is concerned, it's quite impactful because it is binding on 27 EU member states. So there are several countries that do have at least a similar regulatory baseline. And uh, that baseline aims to offer a minimum level of protection following this directive should ideally bring a minimum standard of cybersecurity. And of course, if EU member states wish to adopt a higher standard, they could proceed to do so. The problem with this regulation, as well as with other regulations that we may see, start when we want to find definitions, where, when we are searching about terms that come very common in the technical discussion, for example, cybersecurity. During the previous slides, I'm sure that although we don't have a definition uh, commonly agreed, we all understood more or less the same thing. When we come to law, though, um, we do not always see the same definition across regulations, and we do not always understand very basic terms the same way. Back to the directive here that describes security as the ability of systems to resist any compromise to the classic four, availability, authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality of data. I would like to refer you back to the definitions, uh, the descriptions actually of these terms that Alexander made, because if you do look at the directive, you're not going to find a specific descriptions for what availability is and what authenticity is. Um, the standard of protection, so what the directive tells us about what we should or shouldn't do, is not very specific. It just says that uh, availability, authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality should not be undermined. Um, it does not say, for example, that you should not um, conduct a cyber attack against uh, a system, let alone a space system. But this is a common pattern. This is something that we're also going to see in other regulations. Uh, so on top of the lack of certain definitions, we also have a lack of a very specific standard. We do not see anywhere um, a clear prohibition to conduct um, cybersecurity threats or however you want to call them. Uh, what the um, directive, however, um, really describes in detail and what is really helpful because it does have an extension to space technology is its scope of protection. So it does protect the security of network and information systems. These are defined as network networks or devices as well as groups of interconnected devices or related devices that are conducting electronic communication that uh, performs automated data processing. And these networks and devices or groups of devices for connected devices also include the data, the information that is circulated therein. And here comes the clear connection with space technology. The electronic communication by reference of this directive to another previous EU directive, EU regulation if I'm not mistaken, um, refers to transmission systems that permit the conveyance, the transmission of signals. And in the list of those systems, it is explicit, explicitly mentioned that satellite networks are among them. So what we do have so far is uh, a regulation that does foresee part or perhaps um, the entire space data system as part of the electronic communication system that could be protected under its auspices. Moving to another area across uh, the board, we have um, a rather different framework of cybersecurity in the US. First of all, in the US, there is no central cybersecurity regulation. It's, uh, each state deals with this issue in itself. And usually in a sector specific manner, for example, they may, there may be cybersecurity regulations specific to the health sector or to the financial sector. 
um, there is a more specific uh, cybersecurity regulation that is called the IoT Cybersecurity Act that does not refer again to space technology as such, but uh, to the extent that space technology can be seen in the general scope of in, uh, Internet of Things, it could fall under it. And it is also complemented by a space policy, not the law, I will come back to the difference in a bit, not the law as such, but the policy directive from the previous US administration that includes a memorandum with principles specific to cyber security of space systems. This is how uh, the framework is painted in the US, no specific reg regulation to cybersecurity, rather a fragmented approach split between considering perhaps space technology as part of the Internet of Things and as part of a policy that includes cybersecurity principles to protect those systems. Um, the definition of cybersecurity, of security to be precise, is similar to what we've seen already, availability, authenticity, confidentiality, and integrity. I would say that those are common elements, common factors across regulations. But the subject of the protection, uh, unlike what we saw previously with what a network information system is, is a bit more narrow. So it is an information system, including the information that is stored, processed therein, or is transmitted from there. Um, although it is a bit more narrow, so an information system is not the electronic uh, telecommunication network or devices that we saw earlier, it is really a matter of interpretation of what sort of case you have in mind and whether this case will be able to fit this specific description. Having a more narrow definition does not necessarily mean that uh, certain systems, perhaps also satellite systems, are excluded, but it does mean that you do some legal work there where you interpret a certain thing against um, this given definition. Describing further the information system, um, it is uh, made reference to an entire um, life cycle, if you will, uh, where data is in the center. So we're speaking about a distinguished set of information pool that it is organized in a way that collects, processes, maintains, uses, shares, and further disseminates information. This description that we see here does not focus that much on the network part, it focuses more on the information part. This is perhaps a bit too legal, too detailed, um, but this is what is included, for example, in the IoT Cybersecurity Act, and it's interesting to see just to have another factor, another parameter of how cybersecurity is uh, seen and regulated in different um, areas around the world. A bit more specific though, as I mentioned, um, to the space sector is the space policy directive that makes specific reference to space, system, space systems and their cyber security. Uh, it comes, it's a rather long text. It's very informative, I believe, if you would like to go back and check it later. But it does give um, very detailed provisions, very detailed measures on what operators should do in order to safeguard space systems. It speaks about, in terms of security, uh, protection from unauthorized access, but specifically also from jamming and for, for spoofing. And it introduces a term that I found really, really interesting because it can be as wide or as narrow as you envision, that is, um, taking into account cybersecurity informed engineering when structuring space systems. Um, as was mentioned before, and perhaps it's interesting to make the connection here now, a lot of the systems that we have already placed into outer space or that we will place perhaps in the very near future were not structured with uh, cybersecurity in mind. All those regulations are a bit forward looking by fact because they can only be in, uh, applied from now on. It, it will perhaps take um, a couple of years until uh, cybersecurity is not only noticed in the space sector, but also all these regulations are uh, applied, are taken into account uh, in the beginning of the design of a certain space mission. Back to this policy uh, directive and its uh, memorandum on cybersecurity of space systems, 
space systems actually include the whole network, not only satellites, but also the ground segment, the users that may directly connect to satellites, as well as any network that is uh, connected to this mission. This is really important because it, uh, it is one of the first instances that uh, the ground segment is also included in a regulation, I don't want to say regulation, a policy document um, that uh, refers specifically to cybersecurity in space. And it is important because the ground system is an indispensable system. Of course, satellites and space activities are regulated differently because also they are in outer space, but you cannot cyber secure, so to speak, a system in space if you do not also cyber secure it on the ground. Speaking about specific measures, and here things get a bit more technical, uh, this directive refers to various aspects of uh, threats and various aspects of the space missions and suggests to safeguard uh, telemetry, communication and command links, also safeguard the physical asset to the extent possible, protect systems, satellite systems on the ground, which interestingly includes training and making aware the staff that is working on those missions on cybersecurity threats. And of course, monitoring the supply chain around this space mission. As I mentioned, however, this policy directive is really about policy. It is not a law, so it is not directly applicable in the US and it cannot be enforced by the US authorities or at least yet. But there is um, a possibility, perhaps a hope, that it will be implemented by the agencies, by the departments in uh, the US, NOAA, the FAA, and the FCC, that are responsible for um, implementing and enforcing space regulations. So this, these guidelines perhaps will be taken into account by those authorities as well, and will make this policy directive a bit more tangible in terms of its uh, legal value. Going a bit further around the world, China is uh, also among the great uh, spacefaring players, and it does have its own cybersecurity law as well. It is not specific to space uh, systems or to satellite technology, but it is a very uh, broad uh, regulation that could be interpreted so as to cover space systems as well. Um, it's interesting because the purpose is not necessarily only cybersecurity, but it is specified a bit more as operation security and information security. So far, we have seen information security or network and information systems. Here we see, for example, operation security and information security. And we already see how different countries perceive this issue in a totally different manner. When it comes to cybersecurity, we don't see the availability, authenticity, integrity, and one more thing that I'm forgetting, uh, but we do see uh, more specific issues. So we're seeing interference with those systems, damage, unauthorized access, leaks, theft, or falsification. Of course, um, if they are um, interpreted different, differently, they do bring us back to availability, authenticity, and so on. And the standard of protection that this cybersecurity law uh, introduces is the most specific from what we've seen so far in that, it, in that it includes specific duties for network operators on a multi-level um, protection scheme. So from the beginning of their operation until the end. Um, once again, I would like to refer you to reading that law, perhaps if you would like to see those specific measures. Uh, but unlike the previous, um, the two previous regulations and policies, it does include very specific things for operators to do. Before we move further with discussing um, how this cybersecurity framework relates to space activities and space data systems in particular, I would like to introduce one more parameter that does not come from cybersecurity law or from national and regional laws, but comes from international law. Of course, we see cybersecurity as a specific field of law. However, it is a rather um, recent field of law. It is not as developed as others. And that is, of course, because technology related to cybersecurity has only recently developed. 
When we talk though about cybersecurity, we usually have something negative in our minds. We never think that um, cybersecurity refers to protecting something um, that is uh, useful. We usually think that cybersecurity prevents bad things from happening, prevents cyber crimes, prevents cyber attacks, prevents cyber threats. And this is where the connection with international law perhaps happens, because uh, at least as far as legal theory, connecting space and cyber is concerned, a lot of attention is put on, on the extent to which those cyber securities, cyber attacks, cyber threats, cyber damages, however you would like to call them, are actually constituting a violation of the UN Charter because they are considered use of force against a certain state or are used as self-defense against an attack from another state. Just to put a very short background here, uh, the UN Charter, of course, prohibits the use of force against another country that is, of course, very reasonable. Uh, but it does not necessarily, or at least I do not see it that way, it does not necessarily connect to um, what a cyber attack and a cyber threat is about, because it uh, prohibits the use of force against the territorial uh, integrity and political independence of a country. So we're really talking about a war, a certain uh, military aggravation, whereas, of course, a cyber attack could be escalated to that. We have not seen it yet. But most of the times, the cyber attacks and the threats to cybersecurity that we have in mind um, do not have as a purpose to attack a state or do not have as a purpose the use of force as such, but do have as a purpose a disruption of sorts, uh, primarily for financial gain, or at least for some sort of disruption, but usually they do not take uh, place within the scope of use of force. And once again, to put a rather legal detail into our discussion here, the use of force, the proof uh, as to whether use of force has occurred, uh, requires a rather higher high standard. Even things that are happening on the ground, around the earth, uh, that we hear about and we clearly think, oh, this is definitely a war. This is definitely use of force. Under the UN Charter, may not actually fulfill this uh, definition. So when we're talking about the cyber attack, uh, it is much less likely that will, it will fall under this, um, this specific prohibition. If it does fall, and if it does amount to use of force, it will not only violate the regulations that we've seen, it will also perhaps violate the UN Charter uh, itself. There is also another international commentary. It is not a regulation in itself. That is the Tallinn Manual. And it describes uh, the laws that are international laws that are applicable in the cyber domain. Its description of um, the cyber law, the law, sorry, the laws that are applicable in cyber infrastructure in space is very, very interesting. But it does approach the matter of cybersecurity again from the international perspective I, I just mentioned, and um, with the question whether it would amount to use of force. So certain international law application will be triggered or not. To close and wrap up a bit um, the very detailed discussion about uh, the regulations on cybersecurity, what we can keep in mind is that the main goal, of course, is to protect network and information systems that, of course, appear under different descriptions and different terms. But what we're missing, and here I hint to a challenge that I will bring up later, is how are we going to protect them? Whereas some of these laws, such as the Chinese law, for example, do include specific measures, uh, most of the other laws and some of the laws that I have not spoken about but do exist in countries around the world do not say how, and most importantly, really do not include the prohibition that, uh, for example, no matter what you do, you should never threaten the cybersecurity of a system. This is really important because once we do have a specific prohibition like that, we also have a standard of cybersecurity. And um, the how so far is by providing notification. For example, the EU NIST directive requires from the operators that are under its scope of regulation to provide information when a cybersecurity related incident happens. Um, and perhaps what measures they had taken in advance. 
Um, and as we saw, the US policy directive, for example, make certain recommendations that are not directly binding or uh, applicable, but of course useful for operators to take into account. Another common element is that the standard of security that we've seen so far, once again, is not the prohibition, do not do anything that uh, will threaten security. It is rather uh, the other way around, do everything that you can when you operate such a system to maintain its resilience. It does not focus much on the perpetrator. It focuses more on the operator or the user or who has, whoever has constructed a certain network and information system. And once again, just to be more familiar with those four things, the goal ultimately is to preserve the availability, authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality. And I highlight this here because all those four attributes are something that it is directly applicable to data. When we speak about availability, authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality, we speak about those elements of data, of the information that is there. And that is important because this data, this information, in the whole space system structure is what is making sense out of the space system structure, is what is making perhaps a business case, if we're talking about a commercial project, what uh, makes the use out of a certain satellite system when we're talking about the publicly um, funded mission. Um, data is really very important because this is what that activity is about. I wanted, now just moving, sorry, forward to my slides. Uh, before I address a very important, of course, part of law, next to all the cybersecurity regulations, um, there are other things that affect cybersecurity in space. And here we go more into what I really, really like about what I'm doing, that is space law. As I mentioned in the very beginning, space activities are regulated internationally by a separate field of international law that is international space law. I will not bother you with too much details here, uh, but the issue of uh, cybersecurity in the sense of interference is also envisioned in space law regulations. We have the Outer Space Treaty. You can call it the Bible of space law if you would like. This is something that would really make me happy. So we have the Outer Space Treaty which includes in Article 9 a provision according to which states should conduct their activities in outer space to avoid, in a way to avoid harmful interference with activities of other states. And if they have, um, if there is a potential that these activities may cause harmful interference to the activities of other states, then those states should consult in order to avoid this interference. Once again, we're lacking the clear prohibition of do not cause interference. And you may not interpret a cybersecurity threat as this harmful interference, but also on international level, we do see that there is such principle. And the discussions around this principle so far is that they could be adjusted to the cybersecurity um, context in space activities in order uh, to include one more layer of protection against threats. Another um, organization that regulates space activities is, is the International Telecommunication Union. Um, it, it is in charge of regulating spectrum and slot allocation in orbit. And its main goal in doing that is, of course, to avoid harmful interference in satellite transmission. It does not speak again about cybersecurity, although the ITU lately has picked up a, a mandate on cybersecurity as well and has come up with some documents. So it does not speak about cybersecurity, but it does speak about interference in a manner that is very similar to the cyber threats that we saw, such as jamming, spoofing, and so on. So interference in this regard is any degradation of signal, misinterpretation, mis misinterpretation of the transmitted information or, or their laws. And when it comes to harmful, it refers to any activity that endangers the operation of a service, seriously degrades that service, obstructs it, or repeatedly interrupts it. And what is interesting in this um, definition of harmful interference is that whether it is accidental 
or intentional, it falls under the uh, general prohibition of not causing harmful interference under the framework of the ITU. This was the legal discussion so far. Um, I'll allow you to take a moment to absorb all this information, but of course, whatever question you have, we can come back to it later. And introduce the question that perhaps uh, I should have started with, why we care about cybersecurity laws? Why we care about laws in general, but also about cybersecurity laws? There is a lot of convergence between what we call space and what we call cyber, cyber domain, cyberspace, however you want to call it. And space cannot function without cyber infrastructure, but cyber infrastructure is also becoming very reliant on space technology, especially for connecting various networks. Um, and um, it is uh, the legal discussion is becoming particularly important because we are missing this standard that will allow us to protect all systems sufficiently and perhaps in a uniform manner. And that is because we have some challenges to apply the regulations we saw to space technology as it is. This is for many reasons, but primarily because we are lacking um, the um, actual physical space element. Where does something happen? In which country? In which framework? Which law should we apply? Um, but also because space technology, similar also to cyber technology, being intangible, and now this is a definition, this is a description of the technical aspects that I, as a lawyer, have in mind, is a bit all over the place. Uh, things are moving very, very fast. Uh, when you want to figure out exactly the um, trail of a space signal, a signal, sorry, from a satellite, it goes from a satellite to a ground station within seconds, and then maybe from a ground station through internet or other connections to another ground station. So it really moves very, very fast. Even if we do manage to overcome these challenges in applying the laws, we will still have a problem with the speed in which information is transferred, and it's the information that we want to secure. We may have some problems in applying um, the laws in a, an efficient manner. In any case, cybersecurity is a good thing. It does enable us to do many more things, especially in space but it also exposes space systems to external threats. And uh, the reason, perhaps the primary reason why we care about cybersecurity laws is the impact uh, from the lack of laws or the impact of cybersecurity threats. If we have a cybersecurity threat, we may uh, not be able to access certain services. We may face financial losses we may face other sort of unwanted um, results. So even if there are no laws there, usually, and until uh, now at least, this is the case in the commercial uh, space sector, it's also in the interest of the network operators to secure um, their own networks. Uh, so whether there is a law or not, it is in their own interest to make sure that everything remains secure. It is very difficult once something has happened to take it back. Uh, and even if we do manage to calculate damages, the biggest damage is that this threat, this cybersecurity attack has occurred. Now to go back to some definitional issues in case you have not uh, had yet enough, um, a question is what is cyber in the legal content, we need to ask answer these questions in order in this question in order to understand what we can regulate and what we can protect. If we combine the definitions that we saw in the regulations uh, and we compare them to the state of space technology and how space systems work with the interconnection between satellites or among satellites and satellites and ground stations and uh, among ground stations as well. We may consider cyber, cyberspace, cyber domain as something that is intangible and consists of networks within which we find information. This information is either stored in this network somewhere or is transmitted through this network. And it can be all sorts of information. Um, in the case of uh, space technology, for example, it could be GNSS signal. 
It could be um, data from imaging satellites that are transmitted from the satellite in the classic 00111 um, method and are processed and analyzed on the ground station and perhaps uh, are transmitted as um, sorry, uh, pictures later on. So we're talking about all sorts of informations and the networks in which they are stored and transferred. And we're talking about cyber, again, from the legal perspective, as enabling the space system. And to illustrate what I'm talking about, when it comes to the regulations that we saw, whether they explicitly refer to it or not, Cyber in space refers both to the communication uh, between space and the ground, as well as to the communication between ground and outer space. And as technology evolves and satellites become uh, more high throughput, more sophisticated, more independent sometimes, it also involves the satellite to satellite communication. When we see that, in the context of space data in particular, we are going to notice that cybersecurity exists in all stages of the space data life cycle, if there is one life cycle. So in the stage, uh, the initial stage where we generate, we collect data through a satellite usually, we see cyber infrastructure in the communication, of course, between the satellite that connects the data and the ground station uh, or the receiving user or perhaps in the information transferred from satellite to satellite in case of constellations. When the satellite is collected, it is usually stored somewhere, either on board of a space object or on the ground. And let me tell you that the legal protection of the two is vastly different, but this is a topic for another discussion. Um, so within the device, on board a satellite or on the ground station, as well as between the storage and wherever the stored information go. All of this is enabled again by cyber infrastructure. In the stage of data processing and of course distributing of the processed information, we do see the cyber uh, space uh, inter interaction in the connection of course with the data source, perhaps the database with the processing software, and then transmission of data later on to devices or users, whoever is going to make use of uh, the final result. What we see is that each of these states, stages is enabled by, uh, by cyber technology. We cannot do any of these without a network or an information system. This is how space technology works. And each of these stages is connected through cyber infrastructure with its previous and following stage. I have highlighted data storage because perhaps, especially um, from a legal perspective, it is the more um, prone stage uh, for cyber attacks. If you want to create some damage, perhaps you're going to target the place where the information is stored, but also because it is the stage where we can apply the law better. At least we know, or we're able to know where this storage is. As I mentioned though, there are several uh, challenges in the application of those laws. First of all, um, the fragmented character of the protection, different regulations, perceive cybersecurity completely differently. They offer different standards of protections. Some of them include uh, broadly network and information systems. Some are more specific to uh, internet of things, uh, systems and so on. And they also vary in the way they are regulating this issue. Um, some of them, include obligations. The EU Network and Information Systems Directive includes obligations, it's binding law. Whereas some others, such as the US Policy Directive for with uh, guidelines on how to cyber secure space systems is merely just guidelines. So it's not directly binding, it needs further implementation. As I mentioned, however, the reasons to comply and I believe are made visible to the operators even without the law. 
You have to comply because it does benefit you. You have to comply because it secures your own system from impact, potential losses, potential damage, and so on. Um, how they uh, deal with cybersecurity is also something that different regulations do differently. Some of them only uh, provide for notification requirements and not specifically for measures to take in order to avert a cybersecurity threat. And they do offer also different levels of cybersecurity. Some of them speak about maintaining resilience. Some of them speak about maintaining the operation of uh, a network system intact. The main challenge perhaps, uh, as far as the application of the law is concerned, is that it focuses much, much more on what happens before, uh, sorry, after a cyber incident um, attack damage has occurred and not on the before part in order to avert it. As I said, once something has happened, the law and anyone else, frankly, um, does not have much to do. It's really important to make sure that nothing happens. So the law should look also into creating obligations measures, uh, guidelines, recommendations, standards, best practices, anything necessary for the before, before part so that um, whatever happens is much less likely to happen. And of course, the lack of repercussion. Of course, when something uh, amounts to a cyber crime, there are countries that have criminalized it and if their perpetrator is identified, they may face repercussions. But when we're talking about larger scale cyber incidents, there are usually no repercussions for the operators that may have omitted to take measures to prevent this. And there are no repercussions for the perpetrators, at least not directly. And um, to conclude a bit the discussion on uh, the regulation, whether it's efficient, whether it protects us, we have to understand that space is enabled as a network through cyber infrastructure, but it's also important not only for space regulations to include cyber, but also for cyber regulations to include space. And that is because increasingly so, cyber infrastructure relies very much on space, especially because space satellites enable um, internet connection, and uh, we move so much um, in terms of creating sophisticated technology and extending cyber infrastructure that we're going to need much more internet capacity. And at least in this regard, space is expected to play quite a significant role. At the end of the day, um, it's really difficult to understand where the damage is to locate it uh, in order further on uh, to uh, identify which law is applicable and how the matter should be approached. But even when we do find where the damage is, connect, uh, is um, taking place, um, we may have difficulties in quantifying and qualifying this damage. When it comes to damage or disruption, perhaps to signal transmission, this may be a temporary occurrence. So we may not at the end of the day have a specific damage. I believe we will have some time to discuss how this temporary um, disruption of signal transmission creates tangible damage. But if you want to blame someone for disrupting your signal transmission temporary, by the time you will complain about it, perhaps the signal transmission is back on. And uh, this signal transmission interruption is something that is uh, sometimes also regulated outside the cybersecurity uh, domain. Um, in the space uh, systems, as I mentioned, it is the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, that has included the prohibition to cause harmful interference. Damage to data storage is more easily identifiable, as I said, because we are able to understand better where the damage has occurred but again, may be difficult to quantify what sort of damage has occurred there. And of course, the million dollar, sometimes even more expensive question is to find who has caused it. Uh, really identify the people, the group, the country sometimes that is behind it. And if we do manage to overcome the challenges, 
uh, apply a law that, is, uh, that allows uh, the persecution of the perpetrators. The bottom line is the challenges versus the solutions. The challenges in seeing satellites as parts of network and information systems, making the scope of applicable regulations understand satellites as their part and why it is important for cyber infrastructure, better describe and identify what can be uh, qualified as a cyber incident, threat, damage, attack, um, and of course, have a perhaps more flexible um, criterion on which country's laws we are going to apply and how this law will be enforced. The solutions I've mentioned here seem quite self-explanatory and perhaps very simple. However, they are not in place yet. Increasing transparency in all regards is very important. First of all, when we're talking about satellites, it's really important to register the satellites so that we know which country is behind them. Uh, it's also important to um, communicate the purposes of each satellite that we put into outer space. Um, and as we speak about regulating that particular activity, perhaps uh, on top of uh, cybersecurity regulations, including space among their provisions, it will be useful to make a sector specific regulation, international, national, regional. So something that will regulate cybersecurity in space in particular, because this is the only solution to find the definitions that we need and manage to connect those activities that take place in an intangible sort of imaginary world with a country whose law we can apply. With that, I will not fill you with any more legal information. I would just like to thank you for your attention and I'm leaving my email with you here in case you come up with questions after the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitra, for this very exhaustive presentation on uh, the legal aspects related to cybersecurity and space data. And let me tell the audience that if you want to know more about uh, Dimitra's research, uh, there's an article uh, Dimitra published in 2019. It's called The Relevance and Applicability of Cybersecurity Laws with Regard to Data Storage on Board Satellites and on the Ground. It's in the journal Air and Space Law, Volume 44, Issue 4. With that, um, I can tell you that this uh, presentation offers a perfect uh, background to smoothly move to our next section. And I will ask the audience at home to please bear with us a little bit further, uh, 6.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Central European time to have some, uh, some time for our Q&A section. Um, well, the first question I would like to ask you, we received some questions from the audience while you were speaking. Well, I would like to break the ice with um, something that is uh, really happening right now as we speak, and it brings the conversation to uh, current news. Um, I will read you one of the uh, sentences that was uh, released by the European Commission a few days ago, um, where it talks about a targeted cyber attack carried out against the Viasat satellite based internet access provider, which was presumably aimed at disrupting communications of the U Ukrainian military had repercussions on nearly 30,000 satellite terminals across Europe, from internet services in France to the administration of wind turbines in Germany. Now, this brings a perfect topic of discussion for our uh, webinar. I would like to ask you in general, uh, maybe from a technical perspective, Alex, if you could give us uh, your insight on how did this accident happen or attack presumably happen? Uh, how is, was it technically possible to penetrate uh, the VSAT modems and to propagate throughout them? And I would also would like to ask Alex if you could uh, give us something on the attribution mechanism, so finding out who did it. So from a technical perspective, how hard is that? How do we know now investigating on this uh, very international incident, how do we know who was behind it? And to Dimitra, from a more legal perspective, I would like to ask her, 
since her presentation really depicted a, a very complex, but also fragmented legal framework. Um, I would like to ask what can this very large accident bring to the discussion from a regulatory perspective? How can the lawmakers maybe react to such a disastrous event? So Alex, uh, I would like you to take this question first and then we move to Dimitra, thank you. Thank you, Andrea, thank you. Um, so yes, um, look, uh, first of all, I'm not a big fan of the word attribution when it comes to cyber attacks. Uh, it's actually almost impossible in, in my knowledge to create, uh, you know, to, to properly attribute such attacks. Um, this being said, it doesn't mean that uh, the law uh, cannot do things. Of course, there are, uh, I mean, uh, we arrest cyber criminals all the time, and there are ways to arrest, uh, you know, perpetrators behind cyber crimes and cyber attacks. Uh, but um, this is uh, something that takes time, and investigations uh, for this specific incident that you are referring to, the VSAT incident, are ongoing. What I can comment on and uh, what I can explain is only what has surfaced already on the internet uh, by either the company itself, uh, which uh, of course uh, made a public announcement about the event, and also some uh, technical analysis that have been published and which have been also ve been verified by the company itself that are accurate. So I can only comment on this because of course I'm not part of the investigation and I don't know the inside, so I don't want to mislead anyone, you know, by, but I can, always uh, tell you in general, taking this as an example, how such an attack or similar attacks could have happened. And also tell you a little bit about this specific thing based on what is known, okay? So based on what is known and what has been published online, um, this attack happened uh, against, first of all, the target were the routers, okay? So it was not targeting anything flying around <laughs> or in orbit, okay? It was the ground segment that was attacked, and specifically the part that was uh, on the user side. Okay, so the actual routers of the users were the ones that have been bricked. This is a word that we use. You know, they have been become in, inoperable, uh, so they were, uh, let's say, useless. Um, and of course, this led to not being able to use the service. So a denial of service, in a sense. Um, the malware that was used, because it's not an accident, of course, there is a malware behind it. So if there is a malware, that is not a malware that you know generated itself. So it's an actual cyber attack. So we can definitely say that it was a cyber attack and not an accident. Uh, so the malware itself, it's called the, the type of malware used was called, uh, it's called a wiper. Uh, in the specific uh, uh, incident, uh, if I remember correctly, it was called acid rain uh, by the, the one that analyzed it, not by the creator. <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, dubbed acid rain, and it's uh, very simplistic in a sense that it just breaks generic devices, IoT devices. So it was not, um, from the anal analysis that I read at least, it was not created uh, to be very technically, you know, uh, interesting. Uh, but, uh, you know, simple things can uh, do the job. So it doesn't matter if it was, uh, you know, the state of the art uh, cyber weapon, or it was just 10 lines of code, which in this case, it was like 20 lines of code. Uh, at the end, the job was done, you know, the, the routers were bricked and uh, this led to what you described. Now, uh, in order to deploy this type of uh, malware, this is where it gets more interesting. And this is where it gets also a little bit more fuzzy and more, uh, you know, uh, blurry. Uh, the company itself said that um, actually they got hacked. I mean, uh, one of their uh, VPNs uh, was hacked. Uh, someone got access to their internal network and from there, the attackers moved laterally, um, somehow reached to a specific uh, management control, uh, let's say in a sense, uh, unit from where they deployed the malware to specific endpoints. And this is what led to these endpoints breaking and being you know, inter inter uh, inoperable. And of course, uh, the users could not have access to internet. This is the line that uh, the company uh, publicly announced. Uh, there are speculations, of course, maybe of uh, also some uh, type of uh, other exploitation that could have taken place directly to the router themselves, or uh, by deploying uh, previously uh, some uh, malicious code in the supply chain. This can also be uh, potentially a case. 
I'm not saying that this, this is the case in this case, but in general, these can all be examples of uh, how this attack could have happened. So to directly attack the routers yourself with um, probably a command that can bring them remotely or by introducing some bug that can trigger the, the attack whenever you want to, as I explained in my presentation. So these are all possible scenarios. In this case, the official line of the company is that they got hacked. Someone reached to the management controls and from there he deployed these extra commands that bricked the devices. Well, Alex, can I ask you something that Billy, upon what you just said? Would it have been possible to stop the chain of reactions? And uh, how far can the malware spread in a system? Yes. With the idea that everything is connected, right? So that's the background idea, the general idea behind it. I, I would like to tell you a few things now. First of all, about uh, the impact, uh, because you, you mentioned it also yourself. Uh, and this is nice, interesting, and important. Uh, from what we presume, uh, this was an attack against a specific, from a specific country to another country. Okay, what we presume. But uh, it doesn't matter. I will not uh, name the countries because this is not the point of this presentation or discussion. But uh, I will tell you that uh, there is an aftermath uh, after every attack, and there have been other attacks in the past uh, with a similar aftermath, that attacks can spill over, meaning that uh, you might be targeting an entity, a company, a user, a country, but you can end up harming others in the process. And uh, I guess in this case, uh, what you saw and what you mentioned with the turbines, it can be an, a, a spillover of the attack itself, which was targeting something different, or it can be part of the attack. You never know. Maybe you know it was all designed this way. Uh, this we don't know, and of course, I don't have the knowledge uh, to, to, to tell you more about this. Now, uh, in terms of if you could stop this type of attack at some point in time, unfortunately, uh, yes, you can, but if you were able to discover the perpetrators, let's say that the scenario was that they, someone infiltrated this company, this should have happened a few months ago. Uh, it's not uh, common to, for this type of attacks to just do them in a night. Uh, this means that the attackers were already inside this company. They already knew that this company does what it does. They had already access for a few months I don't know, I haven't read uh, something about how much time they were inside the network. Uh, at least I, uh, this information is missing uh, for me. Uh, but uh, they had the position to be ready to launch the attack whenever they wanted to, and it suited their timing. You know. Now, it could have been stopped if someone could have identified them while they were there in this network for a few months or weeks, or I don't know how much time. Uh, uh, from the time, the attacker pushes the button, he's in the right place, you cannot do much. It's an end game, okay? It's game over. The only thing you can do is either stop him before he infiltrates your network, or if he does infiltrate your network, there are other, you know, layer layers of security which can detect him in your network and stop him from propagating, moving laterally, moving further, going deeper, and getting ready in order to launch the final attack. You could stop him somewhere in the middle there. But of course, you need the layered security and different layers that can detect different types of attacks. Apparently, in this case, these layers were not effective. If they were there, they were not effective. So the attacker was in the position and just pressed the button in the right time to, to launch the attack. Yeah, I remember when uh, we used to work at the European Union agency at the GSA, uh, the cybersecurity department used to tell us uh, that it's like having a, a thief coming into your apartment. And if it stays there for one minute, it can steal one thing. But if it stays there for hours, it can empty your apartment. So uh, finding out where it is in time, it can really make a huge difference. But uh, back to you, Dimitra, uh, from the legal perspective, uh, this is going to open probably aspects of, of legal actions from the users, I assume, is there any responsibility for, for weak points in Viasat and others were affected? And again, back to what I was saying earlier, the regulatory response. Usually when something very bad happens, lawmakers intervene. What do you see? Exactly. exactly. Perhaps this will point out once again the impact of cyber attacks. Um, especially when they involve space systems, as was mentioned, it was not an attack uh, specifically against the space system, but it was an attack against infrastructure of satellite based uh, internet. So perhaps, hopefully, it will um, raise awareness on that. 
and uh, steer the discussion about adopting further measures, perhaps considering satellite infrastructure as part of critical infrastructure, which in some uh, countries and some regions is extra protected. It's interesting to see that from this uh, incident, uh, we really understand that this infrastructure is critical, but when we read regulations explaining what critical infrastructure is, we usually see uh, banking, transportation, and so on separately, but never the connection provided to them, let alone when this connection is uh, enabled by a satellite. So hopefully lawmakers will take an extra hint and will just steer a better discussion in this regard. But as far as what's gonna happen now is concerned, um, remains unclear, first of all, because all this is happening on the sideline of an ongoing war. And this may be really the list of the problems. That's one thing. But um, luckily things are happening on the ground. And I'm saying luckily because this removes this one problem, like where did the damage happen? We know it wasn't the satellite, it was some uh, modems, routers on the ground. So it's ground infrastructure. A lot of things will depend on the national laws of those countries uh, with which I'm not familiar with. Uh, because for example, if uh, we do suffer an internet connection outage, uh, let's say in the city of Leiden where I'm at, but everyone suffers it, um, it will have to be me, a simple consumer saying, I don't have internet, I cannot log into this webinar. That's one thing. It can be uh, the train station that cannot provide any more accurate information and that cannot coordinate the train traffic coming in and out. Could be a hospital. And it will certainly also be the internet provider. If I explain this correctly, and I hope I do, when it comes to the many stakeholders involved, also one point perhaps for lawmakers to consider the many stakeholders involved, we have, of course, Viasat that has the satellite infrastructure that is able to provide satellite-based internet, of course. We need ground infrastructure to receive that internet. And that can either happen individually, so each user directly access it somehow, or as I believe was in this case, you access it through a more centralized um, location. So maybe my regular internet provider here uses some for part of its capacity, this satellite uh, route as they would use for instance, fiber networks that are on the ground. Um, when it comes to the supplier, Viasat or whoever is contracted to supply this connection, this service to the many different consumers. I don't know how their contracts are. Maybe there are some general terms and conditions that we never <laughs> actually read that say that in case we are unable to provide you because of something beyond our control. So it's not that our, uh, I don't know, our factory facility went off. It's not that um, one of our software updates went wrong, which is okay, perhaps our fault, but something like that and like an external force, maybe it releases them from liability uh, towards their uh, consumers. Um, I believe that uh, it's not that much worth for the company going after the perpetrators because the damage is done, difficult to quantify it. And what would you actually get? It will. It really brings us to the point where you have to make sure that this does not happen. Once it happens, little you can do. When it comes to the consumers, again, depends on the contracts that we each have. Um, usually when your uh, home signal is interrupted, you don't get anything, but uh, bigger, uh, bigger consumers, especially when they are, um, hospitals or infrastructure administrations do have different um, arrangements and understandings and they may be uh, eligible for some sort of compensation. Again, when they suffered the damage, they suffered it. Imp it impacted them then. And whether this is compensated somehow is really secondary. Uh, in this whole discussion, I would um, perhaps keep two points. Uh, one is, how important it is to include um, measures, specific measures to not let these events from happening, including those regulations, things such as 
you have to secure your network. There was a very nice term uh, used from uh, Alexandros, you have to provide for layered security. Uh, and also understand how many stakeholders are involved um, and how um, a regulation can impact them all. Can you target them all? Can you only tailor regulation uh, to apply, for example, only to the network providers, or should you also foresee potential damage to consumers or users of these networks? It would be interesting to see how this unfolds, but because it's in the context of a much bigger military operation, I would not be surprised if not. No, no it's, uh, obviously it also opens the door to that uh, very nasty world, uh, uh, complicated by a uh, from a legal perspective of insurance, waiver of liabilities, uh, when it connects with cyber hostile operations, it really makes a, a lot of uh, problems for lawyers around the world. But um, moving to a different uh, topic, I'll take some of the questions from uh, our listeners at home. Um, Alex, uh, we have talked now about a, a cyber attack, the VSAT uh, cyber attack, but in one of your slides, uh, when you were describing the different types of attacks, uh, you mentioned cyber attacks, uh, but also electronic uh, warfare, so to say. Do you do you distinguish them in a uh, in a very in a clear way? Do you have like a threshold or some kind of definitions to distinguish one from the other? Maybe giving us your opinion on that. Uh, okay. Yes. Um... Of course, uh, it's clear that uh, not all uh, cyber attacks are equal, and of course, uh, you can uh, somehow uh, categorize them based on the motivation behind the attack, and also based on the skills, the effort, and uh, the infrastructure that is used by the attacker. And of course, all this uh, can um, somehow uh, draw a picture. Of course, uh, you cannot be every time 100% correct. Uh, as I told you, it's very hard to, to identify uh, the actual attackers behind uh, all the attacks that are happening every day, every minute and every second that we are you know, here. Uh, but um, of course, there are different levels and uh, it can go from a simple um, hack, a simple exploit and a simple uh, vulnerability being exploited to gain some access, which is an, a cyber attack by itself. Uh, to a next level of uh, attacks where uh, electronic and uh, cyber warfare uh, comes into play, where you reach to a point where um, you actively target resources, personnel, and uh, you know try to create uh, a specific situations where you actually can even create casualties physically or you know. Uh, um, so this is uh, warfare, and electronic warfare is uh, part of uh, all hybrid uh, um, um, military operations uh, recently. It's not something new. It's happening many years now. It's part of the arsenal of uh, cyber armies, and they use it uh, as part of any other attacks that they are conducting, physical, uh, hybrid, or simply electronic. You know, so they can do combinations even. So yes. It's true, it's there, it's a reality. Uh, the only difference uh, from uh, you know, uh, attacks that are physical, completely physical, is that in uh, cyber attacks, you need to have uh, you know, this element of positioning yourself in the right place in order to have the maximum impact when you really need it. I can launch a rocket at any moment in time from my home and hit someone else, you know, at any moment. It doesn't matter. I mean, as long as it reaches the target, I can hit it. But for cyber attacks, it's not like this. You cannot launch any attack at any moment and you will succeed, you know. You have to be placed in the right place in order to have the impact that you need. And this requires time. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this requires time, uh, this requires uh, money, and this requires also a lot of uh, beforehand activity before you launch the attack, you know. Now, would you say that there is a, maybe a, a difference between uh, uh, saying that there was a cyber wholesale operation, let's call it that way, or there was jamming or there was spoofing? Is this a uh, categorization that makes sense to you? Uh, look, uh, Again, it's about context mostly. It's about context and uh, when the attack happened, uh, in which context it happened. Uh, if it makes sense uh, on a bigger context, and uh, for example, I am jamming uh, 
SIPs uh, just for fun, this is a cyber attack, okay? If I'm jamming SIPs uh, doing, a cyber, uh, doing a military exercise in a specific area where there is a big tension, then this can be perceived as a military operation, you know, because I'm doing, I'm testing my arsenal also myself, you know, and jamming you on purpose because I want to see how you react as my opponent. So again, it's all about context. Both of them are based on the same principle, but both of them can be done with the same equipment, but the motivation is totally different, you know. Uh, sure, very, very clear. Um, Dimitra, one question for you um, regards the difference from a legal standpoint between storage systems. So you, you talked a lot about storage of data, which is one of the main elements and uh, the, the legal aspects connected to this. But uh, do you see also uh, some uh, differences with the aspect of processing and transferring data? So something different from storaging them, processing and transferring. Do you see any difference in terms of, of uh, regulations? Yeah. I would say depending, of course, on which regulation we have in mind, but I think this is a common element and among the regulations that we saw. It's more easy uh, to qualify the stored data uh, in a database or somewhere else um, as a network and information system in order for a regulation to apply. Uh, compared to processing or transfer data. And uh, in terms of, in more practical terms, when we want to look at um, the country whose jurisdiction, whose law we are going to apply, or perhaps want to identify the perpetrator or the damage suffered because of their uh, elements, of course, it's much easier to do that for stored data uh, than for data that may be in transit especially because in transit may mean any part of the world moving very, very fast. Uh, for processing, perhaps something in between, uh, when it's uh, stored, located somewhere, then it would fall under the, the storage stage, perhaps. When it comes to EU regulations, there's also a specific regulation regarding databases and the protection of databases. So again, uh, having a certain case in mind, we may be able to connect it also to that database and benefit from the regulatory protection of that document as well. Thank you, Dimitra. Um, one other question that I will take before starting to wrap it up. Um, it's about infrastructures. Um, and uh, it's basically for both of you. Uh, the, one of the listeners was asking, do they coordinate the cybersecurity procedures and standards, or uh, do they have only national policies that they impose to their internet service providers? So what do states do with that regard? And Alex, if you want to go first, and then we'll go to Dimitra. Yes. Um, look, uh, what uh, Dimitra said is correct, that um, it's correct, I don't like it, but it's correct. You know, you have to somehow uh, pinpoint where your data is in order to apply the, role, the, the rules and the laws, okay? Unfortunately, there is no such thing as uh, the law of the internet, you know, where things uh, go everywhere and there is a law that applies independent of where they are, because that, that would be easier for all of us to work with. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, whenever you want to really launch an investigation and law to be involved, and law enforcement to be involved, you have to first identify in which uh, area of the world the crime happened in order for the right people to get involved. So it starts from there. Who do I call? Do I call the police in Greece or in Italy? You know, uh, when I have a crime that happens in between the countries, what happens? Um, so this is a problem uh, in cyber. It's a clear problem. And uh, the truth is that uh, you start with the laws that apply to the country where the infrastructure is. Um, uh, base, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about the base stations and, uh, you know, the user segment. Now, if the user, your user is everywhere because, you know, the, the beauty of the satellites is that they provide service everywhere. You can be in a remote island uh, in Tahiti or you can be in the middle of the ocean and you will still have internet connectivity. Uh, what law applies if your phone gets hacked while you, while you are in the middle of the ocean, you know, and uh, your satellite data are stolen? 
for example. Uh, again, it will go back to where your data were stored, where they came from, and uh, where the company that provides this service is located, uh, where their data centers are. And it will go like this. So it will start from always from the country where it, which hosts the infrastructure and the data. Uh, it should go like this, uh, as I explained. Um, now, uh, are there uh, any global EU laws that cover you? For example, if we talk for EU or for the US, yes, there are, which are higher than the state uh, laws, but uh, it always starts from the state and goes higher. You know, And this is because at the end of the day, if you are talking about a crime, you have to involve some type of law enforcement agency in it. So it has to start from somewhere, and that's how it goes. Very clear. Uh, Dimitra, what's your take on this, on national infrastructures and so on? I don't have to add much to that. Just to say that the EU Network and Information Systems Directive provides for some sort of coordination in exchange of information among the various national um, network and information system centers, if I, I'm not mistaken, they all have an acronym, you know. Uh, so at least when it comes to exchanging information about incidents that have already happened and national uh, authorities of member states know about, there is a provision. Could be useful if this exchange leads to improved measures or improved awareness. Uh, other than that, on international level, there is not much coordination. There is also no uh, organization, no authority that has taken up such initiative. Yeah, and I, I will add uh, for the benefit of the audience that uh, for those uh, who don't know, maybe from different parts of the world out of Europe, that on the 22nd of March, 2022, uh, the European Commission uh, published a proposal for cybersecurity regulation. And uh, the interesting thing, going back to what Dimitra uh, told us about extensively, is that if you look at the document and you search for the word space or for the word satellite, you will have zero results. So that's an interesting uh, addition to what Dimitra just told us. Um, Alex, Dimitra, I would like to ask you just a few uh, more questions, a couple just in very quick uh, responses. One question from uh, Stephanie uh, at home, she's asking how to manage the gap between confidentiality of the data. So between data available to the public and data which is considered private. Alex, if you wanna go first. <laughs> this is a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, of course uh, it depends on uh, why you want the data and uh, how you want to use the data. Okay, it, it, it depends on the use of the data. Uh, the truth is that uh, you cannot have both usability and security at the same time. This is like a classic principle. After the CIA principle, you know, the one that I presented, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The second principle that uh, you learn offline is that you can never have both security and uh, also flexibility in doing whatever you like. Uh, there, there is a balance and there is a, a silver lining between uh, the two. Uh, the truth is that um, what uh, the professionals supply uh, when they try to do this exercise is uh, they try to use the least privilege approach. So you start by giving someone the least privilege he has, he can have in order to use the data. If he doesn't do his job, then you give him some more flexibility, okay? And then it goes like this till you reach to a point where the thing gets uh, super insecure and then you go back and say, look, uh, I did something wrong. I have to cut your privileges again and start from the beginning. So it's not a, an easy exercise. I understand. It's something that we all strive as security experts. This is the classic problem that you will find in any business, not only the space business. Uh, but um, this is a principle that is used. Perfect. And Dimitra, your take on this uh, aspect of confidentiality of the data between public and private. Uh, very quickly, uh, I think that uh, in terms of the regulations, confidentiality refers to having the data you want protected. It doesn't necessarily uh, refer to confidential information. Confidentiality may refer to 
Uh, I don't know, all the pictures that I have stored on my laptop and the, the pictures that are openly available, the confidential uh, parameter comes into, I want to have them secured there. And only when I authorize access, someone has access to that, therefore it's confidential. Very clear. Um, Alex, I have one last question that is directed uh, to you from Cameron at home. And he's asking, do you find working in cybersecurity to be highly stressful and or like you are held responsible if mistakes happen? It depends. I mean, if you feel stressed because the satellites fall uh, to the ground, then uh, yes, it's stressful. I'm joking. No, uh, look, uh, cybersecurity is indeed a stressful opera uh, operation. It depends, of course, on which field of cybersecurity you are uh, in. Uh, I have been in parts of uh, completely operational uh, posts uh, where indeed you had uh, an on-duty uh, call at two o'clock in the morning where a bank got hacked and you had to do something in 15 minutes. Okay, this is stressful, apparently. Okay, I cannot say that it's not stressful, but uh, you know, over the years, you know your limits and you know how to, to, to manage the stress. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, business is business. The hackers will hack and we will stop them, you know, so what can, can be done? Very, very effective answer. Dimitri, you have, want to have one word on this? Is it stressful also from a legal perspective? No, anything legal is very blissful. I have no complaints. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you both, uh, Dimitra and Alex, for being here uh, with us uh, today or tonight, depending on where you are following us in, around the world. And uh, with this, I just want to tell you once more that if you're interested in what we are doing at the SGAC Cybersecurity and Space Project Group, please go to our website at spacegeneration.org slash projects slash space dash cybersecurity. And you will find a lot of information. We're always uh, ready to welcome new members. And we look forward to see you at the next webinar, hopefully very, very soon. So thank you for being with us. It's been a pleasure.